Thank you very much indeed, Tim, and uh, uh, thanks. Uh, uh, thank you very much for uh, inviting me to give uh, a talk on some of the work that the Consumer Data Research Council Centre has been doing um, uh, at UCL, uh, up the road at the University of Liverpool and the <coughs> University of Oxford. And so uh, this morning I want to uh, talk about, uh, as Tim said, some of the work that we've done on, um, a, 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 on ascribing identity and assessing, by implication, assessing di diversity using ubiquitous tokens of identity, and that's, uh, yeah, that's our given uh, and family names. And uh, I've uh, credited uh, Guy Lansley as uh, the co-author of this talk. Of course, in, re in reality, uh, I'm the front man for uh, quite a large team that's done all, uh, all of this uh, work, and uh, would be happy to talk to you at various points during the day. Uh, Alex Singleton from the University of Liverpool is uh, in the audience, and he's also been uh, particularly associated with some of the work that we've been doing on um, uh, naming conventions and so forth. So, to begin with, um, you know, so, I mean, many years ago now, I co-authored a textbook which has ground through uh, you know, four, uh, four editions, and one usually finds, a bit like um, uh, uh, Tim's uh, children's stories, uh, that one comes back to core organising principles and concepts uh, when um, when new issues come up, and one of the one of the slides from um, the textbooks uh, is shown. Uh, the textbook is shown here, and that's the idea of representation. Representations are inevitably simplifications of the world, and what we take out of our representations of the world um, can be as important as uh, what we lead in, uh, what we leave in, and. Um, one of the things that uh, I've banged on about in uh, uh, various presentations is the importance of understanding the population uh, from which we draw, uh, draw samples. And so defining populations, framing populations, uh, is very frequently um, a, a fundamental uh, to the way that we uh, represent and uh, uh, possibly identify uh, diversity. And so this slide, uh, this slide really uh, 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 shows uh, a number of different frames, a number of different ways that we can frame the world in, all, in order to represent it. And the census of population uh, has a legal uh, obligation for citizens to complete, but not all do complete it. And so even at the top of this graph, even the, uh, the population census uh, is not uh, a 100% sample, if you like, uh, of the entire population. Um, uh, 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 procedures are used to, uh, 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 to fill in uh, the gaps in uh, particular, uh, particular areas, such as uh, Westminster, for example, uh, um, uh, going back through time where uh, census enumerators have historically found it difficult to gain access to, um, uh, 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 to purpose-built flats. And as we look through, as we look through uh, 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 these slides, uh, these bars, we can see that different other frames um, uh, represent only subsets of the population. And one particular concern, I suppose, for the present age uh, is the reliance upon uh, uh, social media data. At CDRC, we do a lot of work with um, uh, store loyalty card data and so forth, uh, but, uh, and, uh, and uh, uh, participation in store loyalty programs is biased and incomplete representation of the world, but so too is uh, social media representation. And so, whereas um, a, a generation ago, lots of academic geographers did rather boring things using census data that were 10 or 11 years uh, year out of date, the lazy way to conduct research these days, and I'm guilty of it myself, uh, is to download social media data from an open API uh, and do some analysis from it as if it is a population. So this is a very pretty map. It's of uh, tweets uh, uh, made in Europe. But what is it? Uh, so 
Um, is it a map of people's um, uh, uh, home residences? Is it of their workplaces? Is it of their journeys to work? It looks like there's something about journeys in it from the way that uh, major, transport, uh, major transport corridors have been uh, picked up. But then when we look into the representation of who's actually on that, it's actually the subset of Twitter users, you know, a subset of the population, that have uh, decided to uh, geo-enable uh, the messages they send out. And for example, um, uh, for example, men are likely to be more, uh, more prepared to do that than women in terms of uh, revealing, uh, uh, revealing where they uh, uh, reside when they tweet last thing at night. And so we have to be careful when we uh, think about uh, populations uh, because we need to be clear you know, of what is that representative. And the honest answer uh, to looking at that map is really... It's a very attractive map, but as I've said a number of times the like year before, you know, it's really a map of the geography of narcissism. It's uh, you know, the geography of people who are prepared to reveal their, um, uh, their opinions as well, uh, as well as their locations. Okay, so we'll come back to that at the end when we talk about diversity of samples and diversity of uh, yeah, populations. But the main, part of the, the main part of the talk then is, uh, based, upon, uh, is based around uh, these ubiquitous tokens of um, our identities and something else we come back to, our origins, uh, uh, that is given, uh, given and family names. Um, uh, I know um, Keith Dugmore is uh, in the audience today. If you um, get the chance, do shake Keith warmly by the hand because we don't know how long the Keiths are going to be with us. Um, um, uh, Keith uh, was the name born by precisely six newborns in the last, uh, 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 the last, uh, 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 the last year. Uh, and they're soon to become an endangered, uh, an endangered species. By contrast, if we look at the demographics of this group, there's probably not many hunters here because, uh, because it's a name that has uh, gained popular currency uh, in much more recent times. And a lot of the work that uh, Guy and I have uh, done at uh, CDRC a sort to generalise uh, uh, these, uh, these notions uh, by looking at the extent to which a given name uh, is a statement in the first instance uh, of, uh, 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 of your age. And if you'd looked at the programme before you came here this morning and you'd seen there was a speaker called Paul Longley, you'd have realised, you'd have known almost intuitively that he wasn't in the first flush of youth. Uh, <clears throat> the name Paul hasn't been in the top uh, 20 names in uh, Britain for, uh, for half a generation. And so uh, given names uh, provide an indicator of uh, our age uh, and, of course, also, uh, also a, our, a, our gender. And that's one backcloth to uh, the ways in which naming conventions can be used to identify the characteristics, the characteristics of uh, uh, their bearers just by uh, following, uh, following fashions. Given names paired with surnames, uh, 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 second names, uh, can also be used to uh, yield further uh, insights into uh, human identity. And uh, this is um, a, yeah, a fairly old slide that re really summarises work that, uh, again, we've done over the years at, um, at CDRC and uh, uh, at UCL in particular. And the basic argument you know, goes you know, 10 years ago when this work started. Uh, I worked with a, um, a graduate student called Pablo Matios. I knew that he was Spanish. And so if you take the, if you seed the name Pablo uh, and look for the other surnames of people who uh, 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 have the given name Pablo, there's a high likelihood that they may be Spanish as well. And so you might get Pablo Rodriguez, for example. And then you can move back and say, well, what's the given name of that person who's probably also, uh, probably also Spanish? 
And you can do that, you can repeat that in computational terms, um, not just by seeding a Spanish name, the name you know to be Spanish, but any, any, um, any cultural, ethnic or linguistic origin. And the sort of analysis that you build up is sum summarised somewhat haphazardly uh, in this uh, yeah, diagram using uh, a London data set where, uh, yeah, where given name uh, and surname associations are used to build up so-called naming networks uh, and identify probable cultural, ethnic and linguistic origins uh, from, uh, from name pairings. The problem with that, um, and you know, picking up on some of uh, one or two of Tim's opening comments, uh, is that that doesn't consult the bearer of the name. And classically, in terms of the UK census of population, um, there's a category you may recall from uh, the census of uh, white Irish. Historically, it's always been there. Uh, but people's like, uh, likely affinity to describing themselves as white Irish um, may be um, uh, manifest in their bearing a particular given name and surname uh, um, uh, pairing, or it may not. And so uh, one, of the, uh, one of the unique projects that we have been involved in uh, over, uh, over the last couple of years has been to actually see how these algorithmic, these computational uh, solutions to uh, ascribing ethnicity um, uh, 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 mesh up with, uh, with conventional surveys in which uh, uh, self-assignment of ethnicity uh, is revealed. And the census of population is the most obvious of those because um, uh, using the ONS Secure Research Facility, uh, we've been able to access um, statistics concerning the bearers of names and uh, d uh, investigate how they actually, uh, actually describe themselves. And so these are the sorts of uh, cross-tabulations that we were able to obtain using the Secure Research Service uh, uh, um, uh, VML link just down, uh, just down the road in uh, Pimlico. And so, of course, here the objective changes from trying to build a model of naming networks, the uh, pairings of given names and surnames, towards trying to replicate this table. Um, uh, uh, that's to say... The objective is this is what people describe themselves as, uh, this is how people represent themselves, uh, and how do we best build uh, a model that uh, corresponds with their own self-assignments. And so although uh, this, these procedures of um, assigning uh, descriptors of identity using uh, machine learning and algorithmic solutions is not particularly new. Uh, this was the first time where we actually were able to investigate the extent to which given names and surnames are markers uh, of, uh, uh, of cultural, ethnic, linguistic identity as perceived by the bearers of those names themselves. And it's another presentation, but what you can see in this slide is the um, uh, the algorithmic solution on the right, of which there's a number of you know, sort of proprietary uh, solutions, uh, and uh, uh, the allocations that we got through uh, cluster analysis uh, on the left-hand side for, uh, first of all, for surnames, and uh, here for given names. And the results that come out of that are actually quite interesting. Uh, and as I say, it's, a, it's, another, it's, another, uh, it's another presentation, but here is just one slide from it, which actually shows uh, the, the way in which an algorithmic solution is much better at predicting um, a, a ethnicity for older generations than for younger generations, partly because the data set that is used to generate it is one based on adults, and so whilst it's got all the Keiths in the distribution, it hasn't got the Hunters, OK? Um, and, so, uh, and so this is an example of the ways in which building in 
um, building in how people actually describe themselves uh, is fundamental to uh, our analysis of uh, the diversity of ethnicity. And as I say, this is, uh, um, this is um, a, a, another talk in, uh, uh, in, lo in lots of ways, but um, we have uh, built in CDRC a range now of, uh, of um, uh, 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 classifications of ethnicity based on naming conventions, um, some of which are algorithmic, some of which are you know, based on um, using the secure research service of uh, ONS. And we come up with these, um, uh, 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 we come up with these uh, conclusions, really. First of all, we should always uh, assign individuals probabilistically. Deterministic solutions um, can uh, uh, very often, uh, 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 can often uh, uh, be misleading. Um, and uh, we should also separately consider given names and surnames because they each bear different correspondences with uh, self-assignment uh, of ethnicity. And then finally, um, the, our ability to predict uh, does depend upon issues of marriage, issues of geographic residence, issues of age and a number of other considerations. And very briefly, uh, this is a table just to, I don't know, just, uh, 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 just to impress you, I suppose, really, that we've considered uh, lots of different options. But uh, the conclusion of our work, which was published in uh, uh, the journal PLOS One, the Public Library of Science, uh, uh, over the summer, really ends up, culminates with uh, this model uh, along here, uh, which uh, comfortably outperforms the then available uh, algorithmic solutions and gave us uh, something to focus on uh, in developing, uh, developing our subsequent products. In terms of uh, diversity then, what I want to focus on in the remaining time uh, is the way that classifications like this um, uh, uh, enable us to find out about what's going on uh, in contemporary, uh, uh, contemporary uh, uh, Britain uh, and what some of the caveats to that analysis are. And to do that, um, I, 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 I we'll refer to this data set, uh, which has been uh, put together by uh, colleagues in uh, UCL, Guy, Guy Lansley, Wenley, uh, um, and others, uh, which comprises the electoral registers uh, uh, running up to 2003 when opt-out provisions uh, uh, first became uh, widespread uh, through, right through to the present day. Uh, and some of these data have been sourced through DataTalk and uh, Tim Dry. Some of them have been sourced through, uh, yeah, sourced through CACI. And again, it's, a, it's another presentation, but these figures down here um, give some indication of the degree of completeness of these data sets and the extent to which we're uh, working with uh, the entire population uh, or uh, a subgroup a subgroup of it. And applying uh, our algorithmic solutions uh, and our, uh, our ethnicity estimations to these uh, data sets allows us to produce um, maps of what's going on in Britain. And what you can see here is based on uh, uh, one of our uh, classifications is uh, the predicted distribution of bearers of Bangladeshi names uh, in, uh, 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 in England and Wales. And what you can see here is the equivalent map uh, based on mapping 2011 census data. And I think you can see from this that the correspondence, just overall, without even you know, sort of zooming in on uh, particular localities, um, uh, it does suggest that uh, names do bear an identifiable correspondence with, um, with ethnicity, and that this model works well. Um, uh, 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 that's very useful in replicating official statistics, but of course, the issue uh, then is, if this is the pattern in 2011, we won't have another census map until 2021 uh, at the earliest. 
but using our predictive model and uh, the data sets that, uh, 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 that we've obtained, the so-called consumer registers, uh, we can build up a picture of ethnic distributions in 2012, 2013, and so on and so forth, uh, right, up, right up until the uh, yeah, present day. And that kind of model also allows us to look at um, the, diversity, the diversity of neighbourhoods and the changing diversity of neighbourhoods. And so this is a slide from uh, uh, um, uh, Tian Lian's uh, 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 work uh, at, uh, the, at UCL, uh, which is uh, looking for uh, the government's neighbourhood integration uh, areas, uh, the degrees to which they are segregated. And it's not to take any value judgment that uh, neighbourhood diversity is in any sense a good thing, um, uh, but it's a statement of degrees of segregation uh, and the, the ways in which uh, segregation is changing. To anticipate the slides that we'll uh, come on to a bit later, the other work that uh, uh, Guy and Wen uh, have been doing is using these tokens of um, a, a, a identity to link records between uh, elect, uh, consumer registers from every year from 1997 uh, through into uh, the, the present day. Um, so I might like to think you know, uh, there is only one Paul Longley, there isn't, there's 13. Um, uh, uh, but uh, but I, I, I can be reasonably confident which, uh, which, observ which one of those 13 uh, I am linking through the time periods from 1997 to the present day. It's even easier uh, at this end of the distribution where there truly is only one uh, Guy Lansley uh, and many, uh, many pairings of given and uh, family names uh, are uh, completely unique. And even when we get down this end uh, of the spectrum, the, uh, the thousands of bearers of uh, the name uh, John Smith, uh, when we actually pair them within households, the most common pairing uh, of names in households in Britain is uh, the other names John and Margaret Smith. Even when we, uh, even when we pair them, um, uh, they are un uh, uh, there are unlikely to be many pairings of those particular uh, 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 those uh, uh, those particular names. And what we've also done uh, is cross-reference uh, these data with uh, the land registry data and so even if there are multiple occurrences of John and Margaret Smith when they disappear from one register and appear in the other they're unlikely to have moved house uh, you know, within, the same, you know, within the same calendar year. So what does that enable us to do then? I mean going back to, uh, going back to the, uh, um, uh, uh, the map of um, uh, Bangladesh's. Um, what this sort of analysis allows us to do is to look at the changing diversity uh, of neighbourhoods uh, neighborhoods over time. And so these, uh, this is the change in the uh, Pakistani population uh, in uh, Bradford and Leeds over the period 1997 uh, to uh, 2016. And this, here, these are, this is a tame demo from uh, the maps.cdrc.ac.uk uh, uh, website. And it's showing how these linked data uh, allow us to look at uh, the changing distribution of bearers of Indian names, uh, the uh, displacement of uh, Bangladeshis over, uh, uh, over recent times uh, in Tower Hamlets uh, within the, um, in the east end of London, uh, and the kaleidoscope of movement and activity uh, of bearers of so-called white other names, uh, a, a categorisation uh, from the census of population which is somewhat ambiguous, as we may get a chance to say, see briefly uh, in, a, in a few moments. Comparison of one register with another register also allows us to build up measures of the changing, uh, 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 the, the changing composition uh, of neighbourhoods and also the turnover uh, of residents. And so this slide, from, uh, uh, again from the MAPS uh, website, uh, looks at the proportion of residents that 
uh, are new. And you can see, I think this is the University of West of England here, which was, uh, which was uh, rapidly developed during uh, uh, this period. And out here, you can see a greenfield site near uh, Porty's Head um, uh, becoming developed over the, uh, over the time period. And so uh, names uh, 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 allow us to look at not only the changing diversity of neighbourhoods, but uh, also aspects of uh, neighbourhood churn. And then, uh, yeah, and then finally, because these data uh, are linked at the individual level, because Paul Longley is tracked re with reasonable re uh, reliability uh, uh, between the moves that he's made um, over a 20-year 20, 20 period, we can begin to build up um, a, analyses like this. And this is, uh, I should emphasise this is very much uh, work in progress. And so it's looking at um, uh, deprivation quintiles using the 2015 uh, index of multiple deprivation, ranging from the most deprived quintile to the least deprived quintile. And it's looking at the extent to which um, uh, spatial mobility, geographic mobility, is associated in effect with uh, so, uh, uh, social mobility. And so the residents of the most deprived qu uh, uh, quintile uh, uh, predominantly remain in that quintile uh, when they move uh, over this two-year uh, over this two-year period. And this is this this is called an alluvial plot. Um, and uh, it, it's, uh, yeah, there are shifting sands, or they, 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 to pursue that sort of analogy, uh, 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 in the sense that, um, in the sense that uh, uh, these, uh, these analyses are being both extended and refined. And it's not a straightforward task in terms of big data analysis. We have, I think we have 6.6 .6 billion potential interactions uh, of individuals over the period 1997 to, uh, to, to the present day. But it does show some, uh, some patterns of uh, social uh, 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 mobility that, uh, uh, that accompany, uh, uh, accompany residential change. So I'm moving. Um, how are we doing for time? Have we got another speaker, Tim? I can talk very slowly. Yeah, okay, okay. Yeah. So, uh, I, uh, what I was expecting to be some uh, yeah, concluding points, but uh, which may end up being uh, extemporised. Uh, I mentioned at the I mentioned at the beginning the um, yeah the relevance I suppose in my own personal sense of you know, pedagogy and sort of setting down core organising principles and concepts and looking at their yeah, 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 looking at their, um, their continuing uh, relevance over time. Uh, this is actually a slide from the first edition uh, yeah, of the textbook, which has still survived you know, sort of through yeah, all four yeah, editions. And it's, and it's used to... It's got nothing to do with the sort of diversity that we're talking about in, in terms of this conference, but it's, uh, it's an image of, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a map of uh, an area of Leicestershire. What we can see here is the um, Precambrian sort of uplands of uh, Charnwood Forest, uh, which slope down towards a floodplain, you know, on which the you know, settlements of the boot and shoe industry, if you like, were uh, established a long time ago. And the you know the canalised floodplain of the river here, the river saw, and I use this map. Uh, I use this map in, uh, or have used this map in uh, uh, lectures over the years uh, to illustrate a point which is relevant to our discussion of uh, our discussion of, uh, of diversity, and that is again going back to framing the population. If you want to produce a representation of that landscape, it's clear that one of the key variables that's measured by this map, altitude, uh, is much more variable in this area of upland than on the floodplain of the river. Or to show it in terms of a photograph, if we were building a, uh, if we were trying to build a representation, a representation of uh, uh, this landscape, 
we would need many fewer points to represent the flat uh, surface of the lake. We'd need many more sample points to represent the jagged, rugged, uh, mountainous area in the background. And we'd need an intermediate you know, sort of sampling uh, density uh, to, uh, to represent the, uh, the intervening periods, uh, the, intervening, uh, uh, the intervening areas. And this is something which you know, sort of can be replicated using our names analysis to look at uh, the diversity, the distribution of outcomes, but to come back to Tim's point, uh, not, necess uh, not, uh, not, not invariably at the expense of understanding the individual uh, and the individual's place within that distribution. What we can see here is a, a ridge plot that uh, guys put together. And again here, uh, these are uh, the most, uh, uh, this is uh, 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 reversed really, uh, these are the most upmarket neighbourhoods in terms of uh, deprivation scores, which are uh, not deprived at all, and these are the most deprived neighbourhoods. And every ethnic group, as defined in the, um, uh, uh, the ONS census of population, uh, has been represented here as um, a, a, an equal, a, an equal a, area under the curve. And this really shows over the period then, 1997 through to the uh, yeah, present day, uh, the distribution of uh, individuals that we assign uh, to these uh, categories using our uh, a ethnicity estimator classification. And so you can see at the top here, uh, the long-established um, uh, majority that describe themselves as white British have a strong skew towards up, uh, the upscale neighbourhoods, whereas uh, you know, the distributions of various ethnic minorities, such as uh, uh, Indians, Bangladeshis and Pakistanis, uh, is much less favourable. Uh, uh, some other ethnic minorities fare quite well. And interestingly, as we... Uh, look at uh, as this scrolls through uh, different years. It's interesting that the um, uh, the distribution for white other, if you look at it, is the one that changes most markedly because after EU enlargement in 2004, um, uh, uh, white other tended to mean uh, um, Eastern European nations more than you know the old. Uh, EU 15 uh, uh, nations, which, uh, which uh, was the bulk of this uh, group uh, uh, prior to them. And so it's th this sort of analysis using consumer data um, is very useful because it gives us some idea of the distributions uh, from which uh, they, were uh, they were drawn. But that isn't always the, uh, the whole picture, and I think it's very important that when we, uh, when we investigate diversity, uh, that we uh, consider the exceptions uh, that um, uh, uh, underlie the rule. This map, uh, in this map, uh, deprivation scores, I think, are reversed. So this is the most deprived uh, neighbourhood in the UK, and this is the least described. Uh, at least deprived, okay? Um, and you can see from here, you know, the count going up the side uh, shows that these two, these two groups have approximately, you know, you know, sort of uh, bipolar uh, distributions. You know, this one is very heavily skewed towards uh, down market neighbourhoods, uh, deprived ones, and this one is very much skewed to upmarket uh, neighbourhoods. Um, I, I don't know how long we're going to wait for the next speaker, but what's the variable? Any ideas? I don't know. Coffee might be the variable. Okay, right. Well, in that case, I will carry on uh, because uh, the variable, uh, the variable that's being plotted there, is surname. Okay, uh, which is I, th I, th I, th I find quite astounding uh, in that uh, uh, surnames. Uh, well, for, first came into popular parlance in, uh, in Britain somewhere between the 12th and the 14th centuries. Um, 
and social historians that we've uh, yeah, yeah, had dialogue with at um, uh, the LSE, uh, Neil Cummins and Greg Clark, uh, the, uh, Clark University, uh, um, uh, one of the uh, University of California universities, uh, have done some analysis which basically says that wealth is a more directly inherited trait than height if you go in, a, in, a, in an intergenerational sense in uh, British society. And so something has happened here uh, in terms of intergenerational <coughs> transmission uh, of uh, uh, wealth uh, uh, and, uh, uh, and opportunity. And part of the reason for that at CDRC, we're linking the present in terms of consumer data sets uh, to the past. And this map, uh, uh, I did... Uh, James Cheshire did for me, in actual fact, a, 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 few, a few years ago when I was giving a talk immediately before my, Michael Palin. Um, and what this shows is how most Palins actually don't get out very much at all. Um, uh, the, this, uh, this curve delineates 95% of the bearers of the name Palin in 1881. And yes, they've cascaded through the settlement uh, hierarchy, they've gone to the big cities and they've spread out a bit, but most people don't move. And so uh, the opportunities of individuals um, are very often framed by uh, the, the, the neighbourhoods in which they grow up or the circumstances in which they grow up uh, in an intergenerational sense. And I think that becomes important when we also, uh, we, uh, when we un pick diversity analysis. So here's, some, uh, here's another uh, distribution. Uh, uh, again, these are the most deprived neighbourhoods, these are the most deprived neighbourhoods, and both of these names are Indian. Okay? And so we need to be very careful uh, in terms of those um, ridge plots that I was showing a, a while ago of saying you know, Indian equals deprived, because we can see clearly sort of subgroups within uh, this very small subsample of bearers of Indian names uh, that, uh, yeah, that uh, uh, their outcomes in terms of the types of neighbourhoods in which families continue to reside in, their, um, uh, 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 in, the, uh, in the country to which they've migrated uh, vary still fair, uh, yeah, pretty systematically. And we can trace this in a geographic sense, and this is a map put together by Oliver O'Brien. You can look at the distribution of bearers of those two names in the country of origin and uh, identify that uh, the more uh, upscale uh, example uh, it tended to, it tends to be uh, concentrated, uh, it tends to be uh, concentrated in uh, uh, Calcutta. So I think this is the sort of end point, if you like, you know, sort of, of uh, you know, the analysis. And I think the important points to note is that you know, diversity of itself, we may think it's desirable and you know, uh, 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 nice or whatever, but diversity of itself is not a moral good. Um, uh, um, it, it, is, uh, it, it is an indicator uh, of, uh, of the way that the... Um, the economic system uh, uh, works. Uh, and the liberal in us might you know, sort of ascribe that to you know, the effects of you know, the character of the individual, going back to the, uh, what Tim was saying in his opening comments. Uh, the Marxist in us uh, might say it, it reflects the structural characteristics of the way that labour markets work, for example. But this kind of analysis, and particularly the highly disaggregate scale at which it's, uh, which it's carried out, allows us to make better indicators uh, of, um, of diversity uh, in uh, a, a transparent and intelligible way. And they also you know, allow us to cross-classify uh, outcomes in ways that uh, it, it prevent us becoming shackled to identity politics, uh, starting to think that all members of a particular group um, are and always have been um, a, a disadvantaged relative uh, to the population from which they're drawn. So 
diversity uh, is, uh, uh, is not a moral good. We need to uh, beware of discrimination in any of its shapes and forms, and that includes um, uh, uh, positive discrimination. Um, and uh, we need also to use uh, analytics like this uh, to uh, ensure that the quest for diversity um, doesn't uh, constrain uh, uh, the diversity of opinion that we tolerate. So um, the uh, classification, the ethnicity estimator classification that uh, I've described uh, can be, you can apply for a, a license to use that uh, completely free uh, from uh, this web website. The maps that I showed are from uh, Ollie O'Brien's brilliant you know, maps.cdrc.ac.uk uh, website. Uh, and um, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thanks very much for listening.